Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we are looking at A-level psychology, the optional topic of stress. Before we jump into the video, again, like always, please subscribe. I really, really appreciate it. Like the video if you found it useful. Um, and you can also check out a load of other psychology videos on my channel. And I also have sociology and chemistry videos up on my channel as well, if you happen to study those subjects as well. Um, and also, if you have any questions, please feel free to just comment them below and either myself or your fellow students will get back to you. But let's just jump straight in now. Starting off with the physiology of stress. Apologies if you can hear a plane in the background. Um, the physiology of stress is the study of the biological processes underlying stress. Stressors prompt a physiological response that was first described as general adaptation syndrome by Hans Sale. Apologies, like, don't... Don't come for me for mispronouncing anyone's names, please. Um, this has been broken down into two biological systems for short-term and long-term stress. So starting off with general adaptation syndrome. So Sale in 1936 conducted experiments where rats were exposed to various stresses and observed common physiological sequences in response. Um, so you have alarm reaction. So the hypothalamus sends a signal to the sympathetic nervous system, SNS, to release adrenaline and noradrenaline to overcome stressor. Then we have resistance. So if the stressor hasn't gone away, levels of adrenaline and noradrenaline decline and cortisol increases to provide energy. And, but this cannot be maintained um, because it takes a lot and your body can only survive so long on cortisol. Then you have exhaustion, so if the stressor still isn't gone, the body starts running out of resources to maintain constantly elevated levels of stress hormones and sympathetic nervous activity. This can manifest as physical symptoms such as low blood, low blood sugar, high blood pressure, immunosuppression and heart disease. Obviously part of this is that it has research support from Sale and a few other people, but on the other hand, essentially with Sale's research is that it was an animal study. The, the how how easy it is to apply that to humans is questionable but then this is broken down into two systems so you you have the sympathomedullary pathway so this is associated with acute or short-term stress so the hypothalamus sends a signal to the sympathetic part of the autonomic nervous system the ans the signal triggers the adrenal medulla to release adrenaline and noradrenaline this increases bodily activity such as heart rate, breathing, and non-essential activities slow down, such as digestion. Once the stressor is gone, the parasympathetic part of the ANS it reduces bodily activity and switches to rest and digest. But on the other hand, we have the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system. So this is associated with chronic or long-term stress. The hypothalamus starts releasing corticotropin-releasing hormone, CRH, which then tells the pituitary gland to start releasing adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. This hormone then tells the adrenal cortex to release cortisol, which provides energy. Cort cortisol is a glucocorticoid hormone that increases blood sugar by converting protein to glucose, and the negative effects of cortisol in the long term include immunosuppression and increased risk of illness. Then we have the role of stress in illness. Obviously, we discussed a little bit about um, how immunosuppression is a sign of like chronic stress. Um, so immunosuppression means a reduction in the ability of the immune system to fight off disease, as it identifies foreign things like bacteria and viruses within the body and destroys them. Cortisol um, reduces the production of the immune cells, reducing the effectiveness of the immune system. Key Colt Glazer et al. in 1984 took blood samples from 75 medical students a month before their exams and again on the day of exams and found the immune cells were much lower on exam day um, where there was high stress. In the short term, this isn't too much of an issue, but in the long term, it is associated with increased risk of diseases such as influenza and cancer um, as there are fewer immune cells to fight off viruses and clear these cancerous cells. Stress is also associated with cardiovascular disorders, so Yousef Et al. in 2004 compared lifestyle factors of those who had a heart attack compared to a control group who hadn't had heart attacks and found correlations between stress and a heart attack. Uh, this because stress causes blood pressure to increase and fat to accumulate on arterial walls, also in direct mechanisms such as more likely to take up smoking as a way to deal with the stress, which can also lead to heart issues. 
Again, here we have plenty of research support, such as Kai Colt, Glazer et al. Um, but li like a lot of this stuff is generally, is there correlation versus causation? You know, um, can these, like, does this, does this research clearly actually say that this relationship is there or does it just happen to be there for other reasons that, that aren't in, this, in the research? Then we have sources of stress. So first up, we have life changes. So um, major events that disrupt our normal ways of living, such as death, birth, moving, changing job or retiring, getting married or divorced. Holmes and Ray in 1967 um, came up with the social readjustment rating scale, which includes 43 examples and rates them according to the amount of stress they cause. Obviously, practical applications to this is actually managing to deal with stress. But um, some, according to the scale, some life changes, you know, are relaxing and not stressful, such as a holiday. Then we have daily hassles, which are everyday irritations and annoyances, such as getting stuck in traffic, neighbours playing loud music, etc. Kana et al. in 1981 came up with the hassles and uplift scale, um, including 117 examples of daily hassles defined as irritating, frustrating, distressing, uh, demands that to seek degree that to see I'm not really sure what I was meant to say but yeah apologies for any typos um characterize everyday transactions with the environment so that you know an example of this could be you know getting stuck stuck in traffic or whatever something like that like little bits and pieces um again obviously practical applications to kind of help you understand and deal with these hassles um but again correlation versus causation then we have workplace stress. So this relates to your workload, you know, how much work a person has and the higher this is, the more stress, the amount of control the person has. So the extent to which a person has influence over what work they do and how much and the less control, the greater the stress. And Karasek in 1979 found, de like developed the demand control model. So high workload increases risk of stress related illnesses, but this reduces when they have more control. Again, practical applications to how we can support people dealing with workplace stress and to avoid it. Um, but there's not necessarily a correlation between level of workload and heart disease, which you would expect with the, the workload stress relationship, which was found by Marmot et al. in 1997. Then when, we, when it comes to measuring stress, you've got self-report methods and physiological methods. So... Looking at the self-report methods, we've already discussed these bits. So you've got the social readjustment rating scale. So Holmes and Ray in 1967 created the SRRS to quantify stress associated with life changes and did this by creating a list of four, 43 life events and asked subjects to rate how stressful each was with each, u each life event given a life change unit LCU score. The higher the LCU, the greater their risk of stress-related illnesses. And if they scored over 300, this was seen to be high risk, 150 to 299, moderate, and less than 150 was minor. Again, obviously there's practical application to this, but due to its self-report nature, it is subjective. Then we have the hassles and uplift scale. So Kana et al. in 1981 created this scale to quali qualify, um, quantify stress associated with daily hassles including 117 examples of daily hassles, such as concerns about weight, rising prices, house maintenance, and 135 examples of uplifts, such as relating well to loved ones, feeling healthy, and completing a task. High hassle scores were positively correlated with stress and health problems. High uplift scores were negatively correlated with stress and health problems. So basically, the higher the uplift score, the lower stress and health problems. But this actually was only seen among women which was really interesting. Again, obviously there's the research support for the basis of the scale, but like always, correlation versus causation. Then moving on to the physiological methods, so the skin conductance response. So how this works is that the skin conducts electricity and when a person is stressed, they sweat more and therefore skin conducts more easily. An example of this is the polygraph test, so the lie detector test. Electrodes are attached to fingers, sending tiny electrical currents. The individuals are asked to sit still for 30 minutes to establish a baseline um, of, you know, their, their water sweat levels on their skin. 
and then they are asked questions and obviously as they get stressed they sweat more which is then why it suggested someone may be lying of course again this has practical application in the fact that it is used as a piece of evidence in some criminal cases to or at least identify suspect but it also has its misuse it's not the most accurate um you know if you're sat in a interrogation room at a police officer you're probably going to be stressed regardless of whether you've done it or not then you have individual stresses uh, individual differences in stress so firstly looking at personality types so Friedman and Rosenman in 1959 were interested in correlations between psychological personality types and cardiovascular disorders identifying certain patterns of behavior so a type a person is time urgent impatient rushed competitive perfectionist, hostile, aggressive, and irritable. Then you have a type B person, so more patient, less competitive, and more calm. Uh, a type A person was more prone to developing heart disease. But then for the personality type C, so Graham Watson in 1985, so quite a few years later, identified type C. So this is introverted, neurotic, repressive emotion, conflict avoidant, and people pleaser more prone to stress and associated with a higher risk of developing cancer and with studies suggesting this is due to immunosuppression. Of course, there is supporting evidence. Um, you know, it's based off um, research from Friedman, Roseman and Graham Watson. But there is arguments that type A is too broad. Um, with Dembrowski et al. in 1989 finding that hostility alone predicts heart disease just as accurately as type A. Then you have hardiness, so Kvasa in 1979 identified hardiness as a kind of personality type and it consists of three key features. Commitment, so highly committed with a strong sense of purpose. Challenge, so st stresses are challenges to be overcome and grow and improve from. Then you have control, so uh, an, a hardy individual has an internal locus of control, so essentially believing that their choices shape their life. Cabasa in 1979 it uses the social readjustment rating scale and found that hardy personality types are more resistant to stress-related illnesses even when actual stress is similar. Supporting evidence for this, obviously from Cabasa and others, but the negative is that some of the three seats are more important than others in Cabasa's original work. They all tend to be looked at with a similar importance level, but, you know... Um, Challenge may be more important than commitment or um, commitment more important than control, etc. Then you have gender differences in stress. So the sympathomedullary fight-flight response differs between men and women. Taylor et al. in 2000 found when responded that found women responded more calmly and protected and cared for off offspring and, seems, and seeked out social support, a.k.a. tend and befriend. It is suggested this difference is related to differing oxytocin levels. Obviously, there's evidence for this from Taylor et al., but there are methodological concerns as most of the focus into of research into fight and flight responses is on males, so more research into females is needed. Now, there are four ways to cope with stress. So starting off with drug therapy, so you can be placed on benzodiazepines such as Valium, which increases the effect of a neurotransmitter called gamma aminobutyric acid, or known as GABA, which is an inhi inhibitory neurotransmitter, and by increasing this, it reduces activity in the nervous system and counteracts effects of excitatory neurotransmitters, such as serotonin, to create a feeling of calm and relaxation and reduced anxiety and stress. Then you have beta blockers, which reduce activity of the sympathetic nervous system by blocking beta adrenergic receptors, this stops adrenaline and noradrenaline having an effect and reducing some of the physical symptoms of anxiety and stress. Of course, there is scientific evidence to um, boost these and to show their importance. But of course, there is side effects and addictions um, that come with drug therapy. And also, it doesn't actually address the baseline issue of why the individual is stressed in the first place. Then you have a stress inoculation therapy. So Mike and Baum in 1985 developed this as a form of CBT with three components, starting with conceptualization. So identifying and understanding the stressor and 
negative strategies for dealing with these. Then you have skill acquisition and rehearsal, so teach techniques to deal with the stresses, um, which can be relaxation and cognitive strategies. Then you have application, so practicing these new techniques using visualization or role play. Of course, this tackles the underlying factors, but like all therapy, it is not readily available um, to a lot of people. It's either expensive or something that's just not available in the area. Then you have biofeedback. So this teaches people to identify and control the physiological processes of stress to create feelings of relaxation via operant conditioning. So starting off with awareness, so being aware they are experiencing the physiological symptoms of stress. Then control, so taught techniques to control these symptoms when they occur. Receiving feedback from machines such as being able to see their heart rate go down on a machine. And finally application, so applying these techniques in biofeedback to real life situation. Again, tackles underlying factors, but also not easily available. Then you have social support, so instrumental support, um, practical help, such as stressed about house renovations, so a friend helps with the task. Then you've got emotional support, so improving someone's mood by providing care and comfort, such as listening to them as they discuss their feelings, and esteem support, so improving someone's confidence in their ability to deal with a stressor e.g. telling someone how skilled they are for a difficult work task. Obviously, this has got practical applications because it can show how our friends and family and those we care about can support us. But obviously, when you're struggling with stress or any kind of emotional issues, it can be difficult to reach out for support. So this isn't always the most accessible option either. But that's everything for today. That is the stress module done and completed. Please, of course, let me know if you have any questions at all. If you found this video useful, please like the video and subscribe as well and check out the rest of my A-level psychology videos. They're all in a nice little handy playlist for you to look at and I shall speak to you soon.